Bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia management and simco and each of these are going to be case based so that you know you can relate to the ecg findings as well as the management and uh, we have we have tried to keep it as simple as possible so that everyone from the first year pediatric resident to someone who is more well versed with ecgs can follow the discussion um unfortunately uh, you know because this is going to be an online webinar it, it, there is limited scope to make it very interactive but uh, at the end of the discussion please feel free to ask all of your questions and uh, and uh, you know we can both of us share our email ids and you are more than welcome to uh, ask your questions or uh, send in your interesting cases for opinions uh, so without wasting much time i'll go to the first talk which is on the basics of ecg interpretation i call it demystifying the ecg because this is how i used to feel whenever i was presented with a tachyarrhythmia when i was a pediatric resident i had absolutely no idea what to do next every tachyarrhythmia was svt unless proven otherwise and um, the only drug i knew of was adenosine i never knew anything about that and if adenosine doesn't work i was at my wits end so what we hope to achieve in the next term um, you know close to an hour is make you confident with the systematic evaluation of an ecg help you recognize an arrhythmia and identify an arrhythmia and uh, and uh, probably illustrate what you should do in the emergency room or even in your outpatient clinic when a child comes with an arrhythmia with an acute arrhythmia before you refer him to a cardiologist a pediatric cardiologist now ecg reading is it an art or a science that no if i were to present this uh, this puzzle to you and say what should come in the in the next square where a question mark is placed all of you will immediately say it's going to be a green square because the pattern is very instantly recognizable but as if i were to give you this particular puzzle and say what's going to come in the next square some of you may get it wrong when we were i showed it in a live seminar i found that no close to 50% of the audience get it wrong and even the others who get it right and say this is going to be a 12 o'clock question actually take some time to get the answer they don't do it as quickly as they did with the last uh, last uh, question and that is because this is a slightly more complex uh, puzzle and uh, the pattern recognition takes slightly longer i think with ecg it is the same the it's all about pattern recognition and the better you get at pattern recognition the easier it becomes okay but to get better at pattern recognition you have to be systematic in your first few cases first few 100 cases i would say do it in a systematic way only then will you become familiar with the patterns so it is both an art and a science to begin with its science you have to do it systematically step wise and once you reach a level of comfort it becomes an art and then it's instantly recognizable as soon as you see an ecg so there's no shortcut to practice not as far as ecc ecg interpretation is concerned the first thing is to recognize a serious cardiac rhythm problem now i'm going to show you a, a very interesting case which got a lot of people fooled uh, a 11 month old child with hydrocephalus who had underwent a vp shunt this child had significant developmental delay he also had uh, multiple seizures and was on a number of medications for the same he was admitted with the recurrent episodes of vomiting and dystonic posturing and at that time was on a monitor noted to have a high heart rate and a rhythm which the pediatric resident interpreted to be ventricular tachycardia the baby was otherwise fine there was no hemodynamic instability but apparently he continued to be in ventricular tachycardia throughout so the a resident called me in the middle of the night uh, to say this child is in recurrent vp what should i do should i shock the child and then he said look i 
can't take an ECG at the moment, but I do have strips from the monitor attached. So I can you know, send you copies of the strips. And this is what he sent. So I'm going to run through the, I'm going to give you 15 seconds with each slide to have a look, and then I'm going to go to the next one, and we will come to interpretation in the end. So this is from a monitor, uh, which is capable of recording both the ECG as, as well as and the monitor, as you can see, has interpreted the rhythm as either ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. So you can see a red warning and it says VFib slash TAC. And then suddenly it gets better all of, the, all of a sudden. And then he's in normal rhythm for a short while. He goes back into the normal rhythm again and then comes back to normal, which is pretty bizarre. And it's not one time, you know, it keeps happening again and again and again. And here you can see a pretty long episode, which I can very well understand, share, scare the shit out of the pediatric resident, which is what prompted the call to me. And uh, a better closer picture of the same. So he just keeps going in and out of this abnormal rhythm. So, so that I'll go to my first question. Have we got an important rhythm problem on our hands or not? Is it something which we need to tackle urgently or not? And whenever I put forward this question, uh, my the universal response has been, yes, we need to do something very quick. And then I go to my second question, what is the rhythm problem? And almost always the answer comes as ventricular tachycardia and you need to shock immediately synchronized cardioversion. But then I've I sort of disagree with all of that. I'm going to go back to the first slide and then I'm going to say, show you the clinical details. I'm going to show you this last line, which says no hemodynamic instability. It is almost impossible for such a fast VT to not cause hemodynamic instability. If you look at this, the heart rate is probably, you know, more than 350 per minute. And it's impossible for such a fast heart rate to not produce hemodynamic instability. But then, if you pay close attention to this strip, as I told you, this is from a monitor which is capable of uh, recording both plethysmography as well as ECGs. So the ECG is definitely abnormal, but if you look below on the plethysmography, you can see a very, very, very uh, stable, regular trace. So it's impossible that someone with such a fast heart rate actually has a very normal pulse rate. And you can see that it coincides, even though the plethysmography is, you know, probably a few seconds later, it has a one to one relation with the normal rhythm whenever you see it. So you can see it throughout every strip available that in the normal rhythm, it's one to one relation, but then the same rhythm continues on the plethysmography, even during the so-called ventricular tachycardias in every single beat. So what exactly is the problem? He does not have ventricular tachycardia. His rhythm is actually regular and normal. And because he has a recurrent dystonic posturing, a lot of artifacts are set in on the ECG. Whereas the plethysmography clearly shows that he doesn't have an arrhythmia at all. Could, could you have sorted it, you know, without the plethysmography, supposing you only have ECG monitor, you don't have a good rhythm or even his legs are shaking and you don't, uh, you don't get uh, good uh, traces on the plethysmography. Is there any way we could have sorted it out you know, without uh, panicking by checking the pulse? So if somebody had, instead of calling me in the middle of the night, actually taken the effort to check the pulse of the patient, they would have noticed that there was a regular normal volume pulse. And that tells you there is no serious rhythm problem. So it's important to evaluate the child as a whole. Don't interpret only the ECG or only one available investigation. Try to evaluate the child as a whole. And as I mentioned, you know, ventricular tachycardia is something very serious. And if you say the child is otherwise hemodynamically well, I think the first thing you have to do is revise your diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia. So with that, we'll go to our um, systematic interpretation of ECG. And uh, I'll give you my checklist for any ECG. So this is what I uh, rapidly go through in my mind when somebody gives me an ECG and asks my opinion. 
So the first thing I check is whether the tracing is standardized and is of good, qual good enough quality. Unless the tracing is standardized, you know, your interpretation can be way off the mark. And if there's a bad quality ECG, there's no point in breaking your head and trying to come to a diagnosis based on it. You just need to go back and get a better quality ECG. The second thing I do is you know, check what the heart rate is. I'll come to how we do it in the next subsequent slides. Then I see whether the rhythm is sinus rhythm or not. Then once I confirm the sinus rhythm, I look at the PR interval. Then I see if the QRS complexes are what I expect them to be or are they different? And then finally, I check whether there's a repolarization abnormality or an STT segment changes. Now, for you, I'm going to probably remove the last bit. I'm going to stick to only the first five because the repolarization abnormalities, at least in children, are not something to be worried of in the acute phase. They are more sort of chronic things and they're, and they're more likely to occur in children who have heart problems and who probably directly will go to their pediatric cardiologist and not to you. So for a pediatrician, a pediatric emergency medicine person or a pediatric intensivist, it's the first five which matter. The last one is probably not that important. So we'll, you know, this is something we do always, even in our exam sheets, most of you will probably start with the, the what we call in Tamil as players chili. So we'll start with the beginning. I put this to say, we'll start with the beginning and the beginning is checking the uh, standardization. So you want your ECGs to be recorded at a standard speed. The standard speed universally is 25 millimeter per second. And you also want the voltages to be of a standardized level. And that is usually a 10 millimeter per millivolt. So every 10 small squares is one millivolt. And uh, so whenever you see it, uh, see an ECG, first check if it's standardized or not. How do you check it? There are three ways in which you can potentially check it. You know, the, the, the traditional method or something which is available in almost all generation of ECGs, even the oldest possible machine, is a rectangular uh, sort of trial run, either at the start of the ECG or at the end of the ECG. It usually is, you know, two large squares in, uh, in height and one large square in breadth. So if that is the case, then it's, uh, you know, 10 millimeter per millivolt and 25 millimeter per second, which is a standardized ECG. Now in more modern ECGs, it will actually be written out at the bottom or at the top, depending on the company and where it is kept it. So you will see that it mentioned in words, the speed say 25 millimeter per second, and then the, uh, the amplitude, both in the limb leads and the chest leads. So that will tell you whether it's standardized or not. So never try to interpret an ECG without ensuring that it is a standard ECG. So with that, we'll go to the next one, which is calculating the heart rate. And the trick to quickly calculate the heart rate, uh, something which we read as interns, or probably in our mm -hmm. final year postings in general medicine, is to div divide 300 by the number of large squares. So if there is you know, two large squares between uh, between uh, two QRS complexes, then it's 300 by two or 150. And if there's five large squares, then it's 300 by five, which is 60. But unfortunately, this rule works beautifully in adults. It does not work in children. That is because children have a much wider range of normal heart rates. It sort of tends to change with age as well. Something which is normal in a newborn cannot be normal in a 12 year old cannot even be normal in a four year old. So you need to be more accurate with getting a heart rate. And unfortunately that means a slightly more complex calculation. It's not going to be very complex. It's only going to be slightly more complex. And that is uh, doing 1500 by the number of small squares. So you can use this as a quick uh, ready reference to calculate roughly what the heart rate is but then you will need to do a proper calculation by using the number of small squares. So with that, let's exercise our brains. Uh, unfortunately, I can't listen to you guys through 
through the DIAP platform and I have no way of saying, being sure whether you answer it right or not, but I'll trust you to answer it right. I'll give you 10 seconds before I give the answer. So what do you think is the heart rate in this particular ECG? So uh, again, you know the formula, 1,500 divided by the number of small squares. And here you can see that there are probably 18 small squares between these two QRS complexes and 1,500 divided by 18 is 83 per minute. Now this one, As this one you can see there's probably some sinus arrhythmia. So the heart rate here is slightly quicker than the heart rate in the rest of the tracing. So I'm going to ask you to calculate the heart rate based on these two QRS complexes. So you can see that there are 35 small squares between these two QRS complexes and the heart rate therefore is 1500 by 35, which is 43 per minute. Now this one, this is a slightly faster heart rate, which is where it becomes even more important to accurately calculate the number of small squares. So what do you think is the heart rate here? So you can see that there are eight small squares between these two QRS complexes and the heart rate is 1,500 divided by eight, which is a total of 188. With that, we'll go to the next question, next part of our um, ECG interpretation, which is whether the rhythm is sinus or not. So the so for that, for that we'll have to refer to the eight oven triangle. And uh, before we go to the eight oven triangle, I'd like to you know, first uh, ask everyone what sinus rhythm is. So sinus rhythm is something which is initiated in the sinus node, which is probably located at the top part of the right atrium and then the depolarization proceeds to both the atrium resulting in a P wave on the surface ECG and then it reaches the, um, the bundle of his on the sorry the AV node and through the AV node goes down the bundle of his to the ventricle before spreading to both the ventricles and repolarizing depolarizing the ventricles which results in a QRS complex. So the sinus activity begins at the top right of the heart and then goes downwards and towards the left. So I'll go back to the Ethoven triangles and I'm going to focus only on the limb leads. So you can see that we know that there are six limb leads. So there are the three bipolar leads, which are lead one, two, and three, and the three augmented unipolar leads, which are AVL, AVF, and AVR. So you place the limb leads in the right hand, the left hand, and one of the foot, either of the foot. So lead one is the difference between AVR and AVL. And it proceeds in from right to left, but it does not move vertically, it's purely horizontal. Lead two is between AVR and AVF. And so it proceeds at, a, at an angle of 60 degree to the zero line, to the horizontal. Lead three is between AVL and AVF. And so it proceeds at an angle of 120 degree to the horizontal. So a sinus rhythm, as we all know, should be from the right atrium and going downwards to both the ventricles. So you expect it to go. So we, we usually use the horizontal and the vertical to determine the uh, axis quickly. So we know that the horizontal is lead one and the vertical is lead AVF. And whenever we look at the axis, we need to go back to our graph charts from 10 standard. And we know how to plot in the graph chart. So 
if both the horizontal and the vertical are positive, we need to plot it in this quadrant, which is the, the right lower quadrant. If the horizontal is positive, but the vertical is negative, we need to plot it in this particular quadrant. If on the other hand, the horizontal is negative and the vertical is positive, we need to plot it in this quadrant. And if both are negative, we need to plot it at the top quadrant. So based on this, we know that the sinus rhythm needs to go from the right top to the left bottom, which means it needs to go in this angle. And hence it will be positive both in the horizontal and in the vertical axis. So if you see, so all you need to do is you need to look at the QRS in both lead one and AVF. So in this particular case, you can see clearly that lead one is negative, whereas AVF is positive. So what do you think is the axis? For that, we need to go back to our... Now, we also have something in pediatrics, it's not very simple. It doesn't end with the, you know, just sinus rhythm. Sometimes you might have people with what is called a situs inversus totalis, where, you know, whatever should be on the right side is on the left and whatever should be on the left side should be on the right. So in those cases, you know, the right atrium is actually on the left and the, and the impulse has to go from the left top to the right bottom. So this is how it is supposed to be in situs inverses, which means it is more likely to be negative in lead one and a positive in AVF. And so if you see the P waves here in this particular ECG, you can see that the P wave is positive in AVF, but it's unfortunately negative in lead one. And so this is an ECG of a person with situs inverses. The next part of our uh, ECG recording is calculating the PR interval. Now, this is something very simple. So the PR interval essentially tells you the time it takes for the electrical impulse to travel from the SA node or the sinus node to reach the ventricle. And during that time, the, the uh, electrical activity has to go through the SA node, it needs to traverse the atrium, go past the atrioventricular node as well as the his bundle and even the proximal bundle branches to reach the ventricular myocardium. So the PR interval is essentially a snapshot of the, of the journey of the electrical impulse from the atrium all the way to the ventricular myocardium. And you calculate it by uh, calculating the time from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And you calculate the number of small squares in this, uh, you know, that between the start of the P wave and the start of the QRS complex. And as we know in a standardized ECG, one small square is 40 milliseconds. So the number of small squares into, the, into 40 gives you the PR interval. So with that information, we're going to try and calculate the PR interval in this uh, particular ECG. So I'm going to give you guys 10 seconds to attempt this before I go on to the, uh, before I go on to the answer. So, you can see that there are probably around 200 small squares between the start of the P wave and the start of the QRS complex. So two and a half into 40 gives you a PR interval of 100 milliseconds. Now this is probably something slightly easier because the heart rate is slower and you can see the P wave much better even on a screen here. So what do you think is the PR interval here? So here there are four small squares between the start of the P wave and the start of the QRS complex.
and this gives you a PR interval of 160 milliseconds. You'll go to the next part, which is calculating the QRS axis. Now the QRS axis again uses the same two leads, which we used uh, for calculating the, you know, for checking whether the P wave is sinus or not. So you go with lead one and lead AVF. And again, you use the same graph chart, which we used in 10 standard to plot where it is. If it is, if the QRS complex is predominantly positive in both lead one and lead ABF, then that is said to be a normal axis, which is what you expect in everyone. If it is negative in lead one and positive in lead ABF, then we call it right axis deviation. If it is positive in lead one and negative in ABF, we say it is left axis deviation. And whenever it's negative in both, it's extreme axis deviation or what cardiologists will call as northwest axis. And I think you'll understand it better on the graph chart, which we will come back, we'll come back to that graph chart again. So this, as we know, is lead one, and this is AVF. And whenever you're, both of these are positive, this is the normal axis. So we know that the heart, uh, the electrical activity travels from the sinus node and uh, excites the ventricular myocardium in this direction. And that is what you see in a normal axis. Now, supposing, AVF is negative and lead one is positive, then by the rule of the graph, you need to plot it in this particular quadrant. And if you imagine the axis has actually swung anticlockwise or towards the left. And that is why we call it as left axis deviation. So the normal axis has been pushed left to word. And that is why we call it left axis deviation. But if it is positive in AVF and negative in lead one, then again, we need to plot it in this particular quadrant of the graph. And that is what we call as right axis deviation. So the electrical axis, which is supposed to lie like this, has been pushed clockwise or pushed to, towards its right which is right axis deviation. And if it's negative in both, which is something very abnormal, which you know no adult cardiologist would probably have ever seen unless somebody is terminally ill, then it's extreme axis deviation. It could be extreme left or extreme right. I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but we call it as northwest axis. And you plot it at the top left corner of your of your graph chart. So um, the why do you really need to know about the axis? There are certain, because the axis can give you a clue about whether the baby's heart is normal or not. So if you have a neonate or a very young infant, there has to be right axis deviation. Even normal axis is abnormal in a neonate or a young infant. So if you have anything other than right axis deviation, then you know that this child probably has a heart disease. And even if you know you do not find anything clinically, and even if you don't have access to a pediatric cardiologist, this is going to raise the alarm bells until you send this child for a pediatric cardiac evaluation. Now, if you have left axis deviation in pediatrics, it does not matter what age it is. The baby can be a newborn baby, it can be a 17 year old, it can be a four year old. If you see left axis deviation, it is abnormal and you need to get the child seen by a pediatric cardiologist. It, there may not be something very apparent even on clinical examination, but there may be subtle cardiac involvement which will only be picked by a pediatric cardiologist and you need to send this child for a cardiac evaluation. Normal axis sometimes can be abnormal, especially in a newborn baby. 
So we try interpreting axis in a few examples. What do you think is the axis in this particular ECG? So we'll try plotting it in the graph chart. So you can see that it is positive in lead one, but it's actually sort of equivocal or slightly negative in AVF. So if it is positive in lead one and negative in AVF, then this is left axis deviation. Now the next one. So you can see that it's definitely negative in AVF and it's negative in lead one as well. And so if it's negative in both of these leads, it is northwest axis as we had discussed. And this child definitely has a major cardiac problem which needs to be sorted out ASAP. So that the last uh, example, what do you think is the axis in this? So it's negative in lead one and positive in AVF. And if you go and plot it in a graph chart, it is right axis deviation. So with that, I'll go to my last and say, this is a newborn baby who has this particular ECG. Do you think it's normal or not? So you can see it's negative in lead one and positive in AVF which is right axis deviation. And as I mentioned, right axis deviation is the norm in newborns. So you need not worry, even though uh, the ECG interpretation may say right axis deviation, it's actually normal axis for the newborn. What about this one? So again, a newborn, but lead one is positive and AVF is negative, which is left axis deviation. And as I said, left axis deviation, doesn't matter what age they are, newborn, adolescent, young child, it is abnormal and it needs cardiac evaluation. And especially in a neonate, it's grossly abnormal and you need to get it evaluated as soon as possible. Now, how does axis help in diagnosis? Honestly, it doesn't help very much, but you know, there are certain clues you get, especially if you don't uh, have access to a pediatric cardiologist. Uh, and you'll always, and the residents here, you'll always be tortured in your exam about all of these. So tricuspid atresia will have left axis deviation. Inlet and posterior muscular VSTs will have right axis deviation. Complete AV canal defect will have what is called as a northwest axis or extreme axis deviation. So if you see a baby, newborn baby with trisomy 21, when you get an ECG and that shows northwest axis, then it's very, very likely that the baby has AVSD and you need to get the baby evaluated as soon as possible. Tetralogy of fallow by norm has right axis deviation. That might be helpful in an older child with cyanosis who presents to you. But unfortunately, right axis is the norm in a newborn or a young infant. And so an ECG doesn't help you to diagnose tetralogy in small babies. Congenital rubella syndrome may have a normal axis in the newborn period. Nobody really knows why that is the case. We know that congenital rubella syndromes may have VSDs and a patent arteriosis, but you know, that's, the axis can sometimes be normal even in the newborn period, although the reasons are not very well understood. So what we want from you at the end of this session is to keep looking at ECGs. As I said, practice only makes perfect. You just need to keep looking again and again at ECGs. This half an hour is just to eliminate you and get you interested in going and seeing ECGs. And unless you keep doing it again and again, you will not get better at it. So the rule number one at getting better at ECGs is to keep looking at ECGs.
take a detailed history. Don't just interpret the ECG alone, interpret it in the context of the child whom you're managing or treating. So get as detailed a history as possible from the parents or the caregiver or whoever is available. Examine your patient thoroughly before you go to go on and try to interpret the ECG. As you saw in the first case, which I showed, all uh, someone needed to do was uh, check the pulse of the child to realize that there was no major problem with the child per se. And if even if you don't know the ECG which you come across, scan the ECG or take a very good quality photo of the ECG. I always recommend scanning the ECGs because you know sometimes in the photograph it's very difficult to get it on a flat surface and also to very difficult to avoid shadows. Whereas on a scanner, you'll get a very high fidelity copy of the ECG. So scan or take a photograph, whichever is feasible for you and uh, preserve them. And whenever you get an opportunity to, you know, need to discuss it with the a pediatric cardiologist or someone who's much more well-versed in interpreting ECGs, use that opportunity and learn from them and, you know, get better at uh, interpreting the ECG. Uh, I hope I was able to you know, give you a bird's eye view of interpreting ECG without boring everyone. And with that, we will uh, go to the next part of our, uh, of our uh, workshop today, which is an approach to tachyarrhythmias. And I'll hand over to Dr. Karthik Surya. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Is it okay? Yeah, yes, you're, you're audible. Sure. Let me just uh, share my PowerPoint, please. 